struggle for clean your trees. When we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. The proof of this amazing love is this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So just as we come to confess our sins, we hear God's law as his will for our lives. And we reflect upon these words. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so together we humbly say, Compassionate God, forgive us for the things we have done and not done. Forgive us for the things we have said and not said. Forgive us for the lives we have lived and not lived. In the coming way, May we reflect the image of the one we profess to follow in thought, word, and beauty, and draw others to Christ. Amen. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 reminds us that God rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so let us pray with confidence the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of your now and forever. Stand to sing our second hymn now, still, my soul is still.
bless it, Lord, because all scriptures should be written for our learning. Help us now to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. That through patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and forever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us in Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Our reading this morning is taken from Galatians chapter 5, beginning to read from verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So, I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the spirit that is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not on the love. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit <coughs> is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no one. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This is God's word. Netflix or Disney Plus at the end of your day. 
maybe you thought your sense of peace was coming from going for a walk in the mountains. Can't relate, but whatever. <laughs> Um, you move on, maybe your sense of peace is just getting to sit down on your sofa at the end of the day, or the last one, maybe you thought about peace being the end of war. We had all different pictures in our head, I'm sure. But what I want to talk to you today is about that peace doesn't last. No. Does peace last? Does a spare last forever? No. That kind of peace is all going to come. To an end, and as great as these things are, that's bad, it's going to come to an end, and your walk might be disrupted. And I find as soon as I go to sit down and have peace on the sofa, something comes barging in and your peace is disrupted. You see, that's peace that doesn't last, but the kind of peace that God offers, that is the fruit of the Spirit, will last forever. And God offers us two kinds of peace, and these are peace with God and the peace of God. So I need to turn up at these confused too. The first one we're going to look at today is peace with God. So when we are born, we're all naturally at war with God, and we're actually God's enemies. And we have this problem of sin in our life. Now, does anyone want to tell me what sin is? Now, I know some boys in the middle know what sin is from this morning. They were able to show me what is sin. Sin is all the things we play, all the things we do, yeah, and all the things that we say. That Matilda's doing it. That breaks, breaks God's laws, yeah. Sin is all things then say and do to disobey God. And Romans chapter 3, verse 23, remind us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, God is perfect and God can't be around sin. But God loves us and he sent his son Jesus. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for the punishment of our sin and he rose again. And that means that he has the authority to forgive us for our sins, and we are given this opportunity of peace with God. And to gain this peace, there are three simple steps we can click on the um, To gain peace with God, you have to A, B, and C. A, you admit that you have sinned and you need a saviour. B, you believe that Jesus came to the earth and died on the cross and rose again. And C, come to him and ask for forgiveness and prayer. And if we do that, we are no longer at war with God. We have peace. With God. And then, because we have that peace with God, we can have the other kind of peace, which is the peace of God. And this is the fruit of the Spirit. So what is the peace of God? Well, it's a sense of calmness and contentment that isn't taken away when things go wrong. It's peace for the good times and for the bad times. And I wanted to read a little bit from Philippians 4 verses 4 to 7, and it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonless be known to him. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. You see, the peace of God comes from the simple fact that we can know if we have trusted in Jesus, we are going to be going to heaven with him forever. And while this doesn't mean that things aren't or are going to be hard for us in this life, that we're not always going to be at peace, we can know that we have that hope of an eternity, knowing no one and nothing can take that away from us. And finally, if you have peace with God and you are at, have the peace of God, as Christians you should be working and um, working out the fruit of the Spirit. Peace. And Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So I want to challenge you. Um, are you at peace with those around you? Or are you fighting and disrupting the peace as much as possible? We should try and live at peace with those around us, loving others as Jesus loved us. So I want to ask you today, are you at peace with God? And if you are, I want to encourage you to know the comfort of having the peace of God, that you're going to be spending eternity in heaven with God, and therefore you should try and live at peace with those around you as well. So I'm just going to pray. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross and to rise again, Lord, so that our sins can be forgiven, Lord, and we can be at peace with you. And I just pray that we will know the comfort of having the peace of God, Lord, and we will try to live at peace with those around us as well. In your name I pray. Amen.
The Apostle said not the works of the Spirit, as he has called the works of the flesh, but he adorneth these Christian virtues by a more honourable name, the fruit of the Spirit. For they who have them give glory to God, and allure others to embrace the doctrine and faith of Christ. 
and that is in summary the fruit of the Spirit. They give glory to God and deliver others to embrace the doctrine and faith of Jesus Christ himself. And really when we read the fruit of the Spirit we see that it's God's character that is being read out and mirrored in the lives of those who are united with Christ. The fruit cannot be produced by a mere outward change of habit or a system of self-improvement. Perhaps you could think of it as behaviour modification, but that is not the case at all. But it is rather the fruit that they're cultivated as God works to conform us by his spirit to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And so it's important to get that order right. Jesus, by his work on the cross, saves us when we put our faith and trust in him, when we repent of sin, when we turn away from sin and trust him, and we turn to him, and we do the things that he wants us to do, and we don't do the things that he doesn't want us to do. And so the fruit doesn't occur, occur in our lives by our own effort, but by the effort and the help of the Holy Spirit as he makes us become more like Jesus every single day. And so if you think of the day when you first became a Christian, if you can't remember it, to now, can you see a change in your life brought by the power of the Holy Spirit made to make you more holy and pure, more like Jesus Christ himself? Richard Level was here a few weeks ago during the summer, and Richard is... The, a lay reader in Marlin Parish, and this is what Richard had to say. I noted this down, and I thought it was a fantastic thing he had said. In the Christian life, our fight against sin is against already cancelled sin. And in the Christian life, our walking is already in the backdrop of a secure position. A secure position. And so the central message of Galatians, the entire book of Galatians, of, you know, if you have a day or two, sit down, there's only five chapters, sit down and read the entire book, because the central message of this book is justification by faith alone. And that was the, the heart cry, the basis, the foundation of the Reformation, wasn't it? In 1517, and the truth is that it is the basis of our faith that has spanned from all those ages, that a person can only be justified through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. There's no other way, regardless of what our rather secular society seems to suggest. And so therefore, trying to imitate the fruit of the Spirit in order that you might think you're, you're right with God, oh, do you know, if I think I can just be a wee bit more good, if I think I can be a wee bit more <clears throat> then I'll be alright with God. That will not save you. Why? Well, it's only when God has saved you that these things will be evident in your life. Goodness and patience and so on and all the other fruit of the Spirit. Working for salvation is impossible. It's impossible. And I think we need to hear that in our own way. Because we do, by default, in our sinful nature, slip by into thinking, well, I'm all right if I just simply be kind, if I be good, then I'll be all right in the eyes of God. And these things, these fruit of the Spirit, are uh, the result of saving faith in Jesus Christ. Although George Whitfield, he said, uh, and I've shared this quote before, he said, uh, well, get to heaven on your own strength, and this is worth we bit humorous, but it will come to the point. Why you might as well climb to the moon on a rope made out of sand. Hence, it's impossible. It's impossible. We can't get to heaven on our own, only through Christ. And then the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in your life and my life as we have a newfound desire to please God and become more Christ like. Do you know why, though, if you're a Christian this morning, that is your desire to become more like Jesus Christ every day. Uh, how do you know what Jesus was like when you read the fruit of the Spirit? And that is what Jesus was like. And it can't be the gospel and the fruit of the Spirit cannot be separated for ones who are saved by God through Christ. The Holy Spirit, here's a remarkable thing, comes and dwells within us. 
And the fruit of the Spirit, therefore, is evidence of two things. One, the, ho the Holy Spirit actually does reside in you. And secondly, proof of your salvation, you are truly a child of God, you are truly saved. And so Paul, if you look in your Bible, uh, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 23, Paul turns from a catalogue of 15 sins listed in verses 19 to 21, and he calls them the fruit, or sorry, the works of the flesh. Now, I'm not going to read them out, but they're there in front of you. More or less, it is. And then he goes on in verses 22 and 23, and he lists a catalogue of fruit, nine characteristics of godly fruit produced by the Holy Spirit in a believer's life, which are the result of walking day by day in the Spirit. There are nine fruit, but they all relate to one another. They all intermingle, if you like, to use the word, with each other. They're not produced in isolation, nor can they stand alone in isolation. If you're kind, you're also good. You see what I mean? You can't just wake up one morning and say, Do you know, I really think I'm going to be good for the next 40 years of my life. They all work together in your life. And as I've sort of alluded to already, Jesus is our perfect example. His earthly life and ministry was characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. He perfectly shows love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in his entire being. But let me just highlight love for a moment. John 15, 9 and 13 says, 2, 13, As the Father has loved me, this is Jesus speaking, so I have loved you. And these just weren't words to Jesus, were they? He laid down his life for us, and thus the greatest demonstration of his love was the sacrifice he made on the cross for us. Greater love has no one than this when someone lays down his life for his friends, the words of Jesus himself. In John's Gospel. And so we have then the fruit of the Spirit. And simply we're going to work through them and, and highlight the piece this morning. Uh, but I'm going to make a note of each of the fruit of the Spirit and be a really own piece this morning. But love, joy, peace is a triad that speaks of our attitude to God. The three fruit that speak of our attitude to God. The first is love. And the term here for love in, in, in the Greek, to go to the Greek, is akape. You've maybe heard that term before. And that isn't referring to pleasant emotions or a good feeling. Perhaps if you can think of the way you, you first took your, your better half on, on a mountain and have that little flare in your, in your heart because you were going on a date with them to the cinema or whatever it was. Well, it's not talking about that kind of love. But it's talking about willing, self-giving service. Agape. Agape love. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. And for Christians, love isn't an option, but a command. What in love, Paul declares, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma, Ephesians chapter 5. And yet the command to love one another cannot be fulfilled apart from the Holy Spirit, because it is he who empowers us to love one another. It is he who works in our lives to make us more Christ-like. And so the fruit of love propels us to share the gospel, just as it was love that initiated the great salvation. Plan. The second fruit is joy. Joy. And joy is the deep down sense of well being that abides in the heart of a person who uh, is abiding in Christ in the first place. I don't know if you've ever experienced that feeling where I experienced it a few years ago in Bible college. And it's that feeling of, you know, there's something, there's something wrong, but I, I don't know what it is. Do you know what I mean? You're not content, but you know there's something. You can't actually name what's wrong, but there's something niggling away at you. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know what it was anyway, but it went away after, and this is what I'm talking about. Feelings, they come, 
time we go, but joy isn't just a good feeling. Happiness depends on circumstances. Joy does not. It is God's gift to believers who are saved in Christ alone. Nothing circumstantial can add to it or detract from it. It speaks of contentment that I am saved and well and safe in my heavenly Father's hands. And then the third fruit is peace. Peace. And this is what we've been thinking about on our service this morning through the hymns and, and Kitty's children's address. No one in the entire world, in the history of the world, has succeeded in bringing worldwide peace. We have plenty of politicians and leaders who speak about peace, but the bottom line is none of them, including ourselves, has ever brought worldwide peace. Only Jesus Christ and Him alone. And it's obvious that word war pervades our, our world. We need only switch on our televisions to see the, the ongoing war in Ukraine. 14 years into the second, the 20th century, World War II, World War I broke out, which lasted four years. 39 years into the 20th century, World War II broke out and lasted six years. And of course, humanity made an early start to war, didn't it? All the way back to Noah, where uh, it says in Genesis there, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. And this continues all the way throughout uh, the Old Testament, this, this idea of violence and warfare. But however, the scriptures talk here about peace, which means more than an absence of war. And like joy, peace is not dependent on circumstances. Christians can have peace, not because they're oblivious to the circumstances going on around them, but because they have foundationally peace with God. And, and this concept is all throughout the Bible. The Bible opens with peace in the garden between Adam and Eve and God. Man's sin, peace was interrupted. At the cross, peace was brought into reality again. Reconciled man will live with peace in peace with God for eternity at the end of Revelation. We see that, don't we? And you know, the Old Testament word for peace is shalom. Shalom, you maybe heard that in, in, on TV or something like that in, in the movies, but shalom, it's a rich word that conveys the idea of wholeness and fullness and well being. And it can also be translated to salvation. We so say shalom, peace. Salvation. And Queen Victoria once stated, and I think this is quite a remarkable quote that she said, Oh, that peace might come. Oh, that peace might come. Now, Queen Victoria then, she probably was talking about the absence from war or some other thing, but peace has come, hasn't it? In the greatest peace maker of all, peace between God and mankind. Peace that is impossible through Jesus Christ. Peace that was given to us when we became a Christian by Jesus Christ. And so Katie was chatting about this one she and her talk. Faith in Jesus ends our hostility with God and we have peace with him. We're no longer waging sinful rebellion or warfare against him. But we're reconciled to him through Christ, our mediator. And our late queen spoke of peace, didn't she, in, a, in her famous Christmas addresses, and she said, you maybe have heard this in, in recent weeks, only people acknowledge, only a few people acknowledge Jesus when he was born. Now billions follow him. I believe his message of peace on earth and goodwill to all is never out of date. It can be heeded by everyone. It is needed as much as ever. It is needed as much as ever in our late queen. Give yeah, those wise words, didn't she? It is needed as much as ever. We never graduate from the message of the cross. It is at the center of reconciliation of peace between God and man, between God and man, so that we can have a peace, that, a deep down peace that never goes away, that says, It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Why? Well, to go back to always going back to the cross. Because I am reconciled to God. So delight in the gospel every day. Remembering that heaven's peace. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kiss a guilty word in love.
And so then our first love is our love for God, our chief joy is our joy in God, and our deepest peace is our peace with God. And next we have our, our second trial of fruit, and that is patience, kindness, and goodness. And John Stott, someone mentioned that name, called this trial social virtues. Social virtues in that they are manward in their attitude when you think of patience, kindness, and goodness. It's how you get on with your fellow man. It's how we live as Christians. So in other words, in response to the gospel, how ought we live as Christians? In response to the state of faith, how ought we to live? And they're never detached from the gospel. They can never be detached from the gospel. Otherwise, we're simply living good, moralistic lives, and that saves no one. And so we have patience, patience. And the word patience is interesting, it's mentioned in scripture nearly 70 times. And in our age of instant gratification, patience isn't exactly a, a popular thing. You know, we think of online shopping for Amazon, Amazon Prime next day delivery, emails, social media, messaging, it's all instant. Those aren't bad things. But they testify to the fact that we live in an instant world online banking. You know, you send your bill then on a Monday and the money's in on a Tuesday. Instant. We live in an instant world. But patience teaches us to know that God is working even, even in situations that are particularly difficult or painful. In this particular bit, we are taught how to deal with people who are difficult or perhaps trying you be patience with them. You be patience with them. It is to take everything in good measure and not be easily offended. Now that is counter cultural in the 21st century. To take everything in good measure and not be easily offended. Patience. God is long suffering. God is patient. And we do thank Him this morning in our service for his patience with us in granting us salvation. You know, when we think of the, the fact that God gives breath to a person who's going to rise and blaspheme him all day, why does God do that? Because he's patient. He's patient. He's patient. And he gives to us patience when we are Christians. And then we have kindness. Kindness, Ephesians 4 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. And you know, we can sometimes romanticize company about the early churches, but here Paul has this thing constantly going back to just remember the grace, remember the fruit of the Spirit, <coughs> forgive each other as Christ, God in Christ, forgive you. Be kind. It begins with caring, being tender hearted and compassionate. You know, the original word for kind means useful. Useful, be useful as a Christian. Love is patient, love is kind. It's also an envy or jokes, it is not arrogant or rude. And you see how these are all interlinked. You might think this is pretty basic this morning, and in essence it is because you need to get back to the basics of the Christian faith. You must not be bitter, sharp, but gentle, mild, and courteous. And then we have goodness, the fruit of the sixth fruit of the Spirit is goodness. And this is to show the goodness of God in our lives. If you think of how God is no good in any of us by nature, and then we are saved by a good God. We are saved not by our good works, but we're saved by Christ, Christ in order that we may do good works. You see the difference there? We're not saved by our good works, but we are saved by Christ for good works. And then we have our final three, fruit of the Spirit. And this third triad is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And these three graces demonstrate the Christian attitude uh, to, to ourselves, to ourselves. So faithfulness, faithfulness. And that describes being, being a principled person, a trusted person. Are you a principled and trusted person? And remember, I'm not saying all this so that you go away and think, right, how can I be a better principled person? I'm saying it so you realize that in life,
light of the Holy Spirit, in light of the gospel, how am I being developed by his power and his working in my life to be a better and principled person? Because we're not, we're not about moralistic living here in Cohorn. Well, the Church of God isn't about moralistic living, but we want to um, remind ourselves of that this morning. And we have the eighth, gentleness. And gentleness is a word that Jesus described, used to describe himself. I am gentle and lowly in heart. So follow his example. And then we have the ninth and final, which is self control, self-control, and the Holy Spirit helps us. And this is interesting because it's almost as if Paul's going full circle in, in the fact that he finishes with self-control because he begins with a list of the works of flesh, that is sins, which primarily are, are, are sexual impurity, and the list of, of fruit of the Spirit ends with the same issue, self-control with what? With sexual purity. So Paul, he goes full circle here. In a world uh, of sexual bombardment, we need to heed Paul's word here, his, uh, Paul's letter here, God's word, to have uh, self-control in an age where if we link all this up of sexual, uh, of, of instant, uh, plus, um, instant uh, wanting to satisfy yourself on sexual bombardment. You know, we need that we need to call out the elephant in the room here in the church and we need to realise that we need to have self-control. Self-control with these things. It also refers to having self-control to say no to yourself and to any sins that you battle. In the battle. And I'm sure, you know, well, I certainly speak for myself, but I want to speak for Jeff. And Jeff would love to have a conversation with you about sins that you're battling and how he can help you, how I can help you, how, how anybody can help you in that. It is exercising self-control to say no to yourself and meet the needs of others. So in conclusion then this morning, what then are we to think of all these things? Well simply I want to say rather than conform to your word, God calls us to be holy. God calls us to be holy, to be counter-cultural. And that isn't you know, some Christians, particularly of my generation, I think they, they think that's I think they think that's a bit depressing. Whenever they hear that or whether they're together in church. Right, okay, I know that's true, but it's a bit depressing that we'll have to go out the world and be counter cultural. But here's the thing, whenever you're liberated by God and the power of the Holy Spirit, I think that's one of the most exciting things you can do. The world and to be so different from the world and the power of the spirit. Holiness is not a negative thing, it is a priority for me as a Christian. And so bearing the fruit of the Spirit becomes part of who we are. And I'll finish with this, this illustration. You know, sometimes you're out in a restaurant and you see a waiter or, or somebody coming with a big, a big bowl of something, a dish, and it's, it's above their head and they're maneuvering around the restaurant to get it to whoever has ordered it. But if you think of that waiter being bumped into, no one knows what's inside that big dish above his head until he falls over that he's bumped into. And then we realise that oh, well, there's shit inside it or there's something else inside it. And you know, if we are united with Christ and we are bumped into by people, in other words, how we get on with them, how we live our lives before the face of God, what spells out is the fruit of the Spirit. And so life is rather Radically different. Radically different. And you heard this other story, and really I'm going to finish with this uh, other story this morning. And I thought it was really appropriate just when our mind are still perhaps on the Queen's passing. But you know, the story goes of when Queen Elizabeth was a girl. And uh, she, uh, she was with her sister, and they maybe would have went to parties and things. And the Queen's mother, uh, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen's mother, before they went to the party, she would have said, remember, royal children, royal manners. Royal children, royal manners. And their behaviour uh, would not make them a part of the royal family. Would it wouldn't matter if they were bad. We skitters, as the saying, they're still a part of 
part of the royal family. But the fact is that you and I as Christians are members of the, the royal family of the universe with the King of Kings as our Father and our Lord of Lords. And so how our behaviour goes, how we get on with other people, it reflects the family which we belong to. If we're, if we're good people, it doesn't mean we're necessarily in the family of God, does it? It doesn't. But if we're saved, our behaviour reflects who we are and whose we are because we're in the royal family of God. And so this morning, as we do think of these things, I really do want you to go away and to really focus on Jesus Christ because at the end of the day, he displays the fruit of the Spirit. If you ever find yourselves wondering, what is the Christian life all about? The victory of the fruit of the Spirit because there we see what Jesus would like to see what Jesus had got on. Look to him and look no further. So let's pray together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for, for just reminding us this morning of, of these fruit of the Spirit, Father. And Lord, we do want to confess at times we, we don't live like we are called to live. And we really want to recognize that this morning, and we really want to come and plead your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that you have not left us to our own devices, but you have given us the Holy Spirit. Each of us, we are Christians who are saved by the grace of God. And though we are saved by the grace of God, you have given us the Holy Spirit, and he resides within us. And we thank you for him, and thank you that he is working out our salvation. So Lord, continue that process. Help us to continually, every single day, put on the armor of God and battle against sin. To become more and more like Jesus, who we want to conform to. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to invite Clara, and we're going to continue in a, in a time of prayer and prayer is going Lord, um, I just want to thank you uh, for Lord's Matthews for us this morning, Lord. Um, I want to thank you for your spirit, God, that you sent to us as Christians, Lord. And, um, thank you that you help us, God, because each of us are individuals and each of us have individual struggles, Lord. Um, you know, there are nine fruits of the spirit, Lord. And, um, you know, everyone will struggle with the same one, Lord. Um, just the same as we all sin differently, Lord. We all and find it difficult to find different things, Lord. And I just really thank you that your spirit is there as our guidance, Lord. It's there as our conscience, Lord. And it's there to help us um, in our walk with you, Lord. Um, I just want to thank you for the changing seasons, Lord. <coughs> this week has been feeling really autumnal, Lord. And um, Lord, thank you to prepare, uh, prepare for harvest in church, Lord. And um, you know, all of that signifies, Lord, that. Um, we're, we're bringing for in physically doing as we are, and um, you know, having Christmas for in, in, our, in our walk with you as well, Lord. Um, I want to thank you. September is also a time for changing church, Lord, with regards to clubs. And um, we've got clubs from little gems right the way up to uh, midweek meeting, Lord, from the youngest of our church to the oldest, Lord. And um, those clubs can't run without people being called by you, Lord, to, do, um, to preach your word, Lord, in one way or another whether it be more subtly or um, speaking out in front of church or um, everyone has their own individual call in order to thank you that you've placed on the hearts of these people to come and um, to, to, to share your word with others Lord that um, they're, they're called by you to um, to share their faith Lord and um, I just pray that you know you would have great numbers in, in all of these different clubs um, for young people and also for um, those of us that are a little bit older that we still need poured into for Lord because I think sometimes um, especially as Christians as we get older we, we tend to um, be the ones pouring into others Lord and sometimes we need to take time and go to things that we would make in order to come into church and things that uh, we can pour into as well and have our own faith in need. Um, Lord I just want to pray for the ongoing church renovations Lord um, I just pray that um, financially Lord this will be valuable for us God 
thought that we would be able to get back into the building the Lord. And um, as lovely as it's to have a church hall that we're able to come to and still able to meet every week, Lord, um, it would be lovely to get back into the building um, as soon as possible. But so I just pray that um, we could have it on our hearts um, every week to be praying um, diligently for that God and, and doing all that we can as a church and clubbing together and um, both financially and in prayer, God just lifting that up. Um, I just want to pray as well, Lord, for our government. Um, these are changing times. So we've lost our claim. We've got a new prime minister, and Lord. And, um, we in Northern Ireland have no government at the minute, Lord. And, um, we, we, we have no guidance, Lord. And, and I just pray that um, you would place it on the hearts of the people that are in charge, Lord, to lift to you, Lord. Not all of them are Christians, God, but you know, even just hearing, I thank you for the Queen's funeral, Lord. I thank you for the fact that you uh, were central to that. And that's what she would have wanted, Lord. Uh, thank you that, that there were so many millions of people watching, Lord. And this might be the only place that they've heard your word, Lord. Um, you know, and that's including the likes of our Prime Minister, Lord, who's there, Lord. And I just pray that they touched their hearts, Lord, and that they might look to you for guidance um, uh, for. Um, as they, as they lead us, Lord. And I just pray as well that we would be um, praying diligently for them, Lord. I think sometimes we forget that it seems quite far away from us um, and all along, um, but all the decisions that they make affect us too, Lord. Um, and I just pray that we would be asking you to guide them, um, Lord, and keep them in our prayers. Um, Lord, I just really want to pray as well for those that couldn't make it today, Lord, for whatever reason, whether they're sick. Um, unwell or other circumstances that are keeping them from being here, Lord. Um, some of our church family or for the wedding community might have been bereft recently, Lord, as well. Just want to hold them up to you, Lord. Um, we don't know what their struggles are. We don't know how they're feeling. We don't know what their face sets, Lord, but um, we can be praying. from prayer is one of the most important things that we can do for people at times like this, Lord. So I just want to um, just take one minute and and um, lift everyone's hearts up in silence for, for anyone that might be um, called to pray for. God, I just um, want to gather all these things up to you, Lord, and um, thank you for your faithfulness, God, um, to our church. Thank you for um, your love for us, God, and that we feel it every Sunday when we come here, Lord, and thank you that we can come together and fellowship, Lord. Uh, I pray all these things in your precious name. We're going to sing our complete hymn this morning. It is well with my soul. <laughs>
assure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.